Hello everyone, and welcome to the 104th episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Norman Osborn, the Green Goblin, from the Sam Raimi Spider-Man film, and Spider-Man, No Way Home. Something of a scientist, Norman Osborn is one of the most iconic supervillains ever to appear in cinema, a deeply flawed man caught between two personas who wreaks havoc and mayhem across New York City with cackling fervor, striking fear into all who gaze upon his gruesome visage. In this video, we're going to examine everything we're given about Norman from his personality to his background in both films, but we won't be discussing his appearances in any other form of media, because as I'm sure you all know, characterizations between different pieces of Marvel media are far too different to be analyzed together. But let me know down below which variation of the Green Goblin that you might like to see analyzed in the future. But before we begin, let's first talk about our sponsor for this video, Babbel. Babbel is one of the top language learning apps in the world. They offer a wide array of comprehensive lessons that help you reach your language goals. And they have perhaps the most crucial tool in their arsenal when it comes to achieving fluency, real life conversations with native speakers. This is one of the reasons I chose Babbel over similar apps, but I also enjoy their easy to use and effective daily lessons. Ustedes. Ustedes. Nosotras somos mujeres. Nosotras somos mujeres. Ellos tienen dos hijos. Ellos tienen dos hijos. Babbel offers a ton of languages to choose from, as well as several different subscriptions, like their lifetime subscription. And as I'm sure you can already tell, I've been using Babbel to brush up on my horribly outdated Spanish, as not only do I want to travel to many Spanish-speaking countries in the future, but it's also incredibly helpful to know Spanish where I live, and I'm looking forward to enhancing my communication skills on a daily basis. But that's just me. What language are you interested in learning? Leave a comment down below letting me know. With the seasons changing, there's no better time to hunker down and learn something new. And right now, you can do just that with Babbel by clicking the link down in the description where you can get up to 60% off of your subscription. Again, that's up to 60% off of your subscription to Babbel by clicking the link down below. Thank you Babbel for sponsoring this video. Now without further ado, let's begin. Not much is given to us about Norman's background in spoken word form, but we do have quite a bit to go off of when we take a look at a still of the newspaper article he reads shortly after testing his company serum on himself. In this article, it states that Norman was one of the youngest graduates ever from MIT, stating that his thesis on the potential for computer miniaturization with improved chip architecture was a remarkably prescient prediction of what in fact came to pass in the coming decades. Norman apparently founded Oscorp in 1966, and since then has managed to keep hold of his company despite numerous roadblocks to his success, like his having to mortgage his house and borrow money from everyone he knew to avoid going bankrupt shortly after he formed the company, his move to defense contracting from industrial industrial equipment, and a hostile takeover bid by the much larger Vala Defense Systems in 1983, which Norman combated by spending two days on the phone, personally persuading everyone on the board of directors to cast their votes with him. Outside of his success as a businessman, he's published over 250 papers on a wide range of physical and theoretical problems, and made groundbreaking research into the field of nanotechnology. His intelligence, contribution to scientific research, and success as a captain of industry garnered Norman a lot of respect. However, this article touches a bit on both how his peers view him, as well as the state of his personal life. Respected as he may be though, Osborne is not well liked, even by those who work closely with him. He is said to have an abrasive, even arrogant personality, quickly brushing off suggestions that he finds foolish, often with a notable lack of diplomacy. He is also seen as ruthlessly ambitious, and there are many who grumble, usually off the record, that he has risen to prominence by sacrificing those who have been loyal to him. His personal life has not been nearly as successful as his business life. Married only once to the artist Caroline Mulder, he was divorced after 10 years of what was said to have been a singularly strained and unhappy marriage. With all this in mind, we have a great baseline to work with when evaluating how Norman conducts himself in this film. In our first encounter with Norman, we're given the image of an incredibly wealthy man who's quite proud of the life he's built for himself as he chastises his son for attempting to present himself as something he isn't. Speaking to his son in a Rolls Royce about his lackluster performance at the various private schools he sent him to, we're given the impression that Norman is a taskmaster, the genius father wishing to foster the same genius in his progeny, which Harry evidently picks up on, considering he essentially claims that his father sent him to private schools because he wanted to make him into the man he wanted him to be, and not necessarily who Harry truly wants to be. This is even more evident in the way that Norman 
converses with Peter upon meeting him for the first time, his face notably lighting up at Peter's mention of his interest not just in science, but in Norman's work as well, another cue that Harry picks up on when he remarks that his father isn't so bad, as Peter claims, that is, if you're a genius. When we next encounter Norman, we find him in his element, the lab at Oscorp, where he's set to present his company's progress on their human performance enhancers to the military, entering the scene as much a businessman as a scientist with a jolly attitude and a sense of camaraderie towards the men present at the briefing. However, here is where we first get to see the darker side of Norman, and it presents itself in two different ways. His willingness to ignore the results of trials conducted using enhancers on rats, and in his gritty admonishment of one of his colleagues, which is our first sign that not everything is wonderful and cheery behind closed doors at Oscorp. However, his first indicator is much in line with what we learned from the newspaper article detailing Norman's presence at Oscorp, and it tells a far more sinister story about what kind of man Norman is, as though Dr. Strom is clearly concerned with the aberration, as Norman calls it, and rightfully so considering it induced an enormous amount of rage and then insanity in the subject, Norman brushes it off as a simple error in one subject that shouldn't be cause for alarm. Now the reason that Norman is so willing to ignore the results here is quite clear once General Slocum threatens to pull his funding on the project. I'm sure Norman, as a world-renowned scientist, is indeed concerned with the validity of his projects and scientific ingenuity, as we can see when he remarks that we've barely tapped into humanity's potential, even after 40,000 years of evolution, in the next scene. And I'm sure he's even concerned with the safety of others. But what he's most concerned with is money, a greedy mindset we were given a hint at in his interaction with Harry in the car, but one that's readily apparent here, as Norman is entirely willing to push this project through, even if it could prove to have disastrous consequences for those involved. On the one hand, it's understandable that Norman would be concerned with his company's viability, as he does state to Dr. Strom in our next scene that Oscorp will be finished if they take the time to rework the formula and run new trials, or wait two weeks to find a proper medical team and volunteer to test the product. But on the other, his willingness to ignore the harm it could cause to not just a few people, but perhaps hundreds, or even thousands, cancels that out. And we have no better evidence for how grave an error Norman is making here than his own reaction to the product once he's decided to test it himself. Racked with unimaginable pain as the vaporized serum courses through his veins, Norman Osborne nearly perishes at the hands of his own creation, but just nearly as he awakens from near death to chastise his colleague once more before he throws him through a window and beats him to death. The same rage that filled the rat in the previous trials, now burning through Norman's body. Waking up in a daze on the floor of his study, Norman has only small recollection of the past night's events, and is now embroiled in turmoil, as not only is one of his top scientists lying dead in his laboratory, but his company is now closer to losing its military contract than ever before. But thankfully for Norman, though he's unaware of it at this time, he's not alone in suffering this torment, as he's been granted a cackling new component of his personality to keep him company, the Green Goblin. Perhaps a part of Norman that was always lying dormant waiting to be unleashed, that's now ready to take the reins. And take them he does, as he coaxes Norman atop his company's hoverboard, clad in green armor, and a horrifying mask, to eliminate his benefactor in the competition, in one fell swoop. From here, it's a slow descent into dual personified insanity, as Norman, despite his struggle with this new side of him, does manage to keep a hold of himself for some time, attending his son's graduation, and offering a tepid congratulations, and consoling Peter after the loss of his uncle Ben, and then making a presence in his son's life, as he continues to run his business without the burden of competition placed over his head, even managing to assert his company as the primary supplier of military technology to the US military. This return to normalcy and newfound happiness is short-lived, however, as upon meeting with his board to share the good news, Norman is served with the bad, that being that Oscorp has been bought out by its competitor, and Norman is expected to resign from his position within 30 days. Incredulous, enraged, and despondent, this would be yet another cue for the goblin to make an appearance, and in a rain of fire, and without any care shown for his son, whose life he endangered here, he eliminates the entire board of directors, and then some, once again placing control of the company, and its future, securely in Norman's hands, just as Norman did himself, many times over the decades since its founding, and in all likelihood, he managed to accomplish these feats back then, with a little help from the darker side of himself, just as it's blatantly helping him now. After this event, Norman is made to come to terms with what he's become, holding a conversation with himself where the goblin berates Norman for his naivete, informing Norman that his good fortune is the result of his own hands, the power he had so desired to unlock from deep within humanity, fully realized within himself, now on full display as a sadistic and utterly merciless monster. But there's something preventing Norman and his friend from taking their success to greater heights, Spider-Man. And the Goblin knows this, reasoning that he either needs to be eliminated or brought into the fold. So, 
baiting Spider-Man into confronting him, the goblin drugs, and kidnaps him so he might take him to a quiet place to talk about their future together. Here we're treated to Norman's personality and personal philosophies taken to the extreme, embellishing Spider-Man for taking the path of the hero, the path of compassion and goodwill that Norman himself was unwilling to tread in his pursuit of profits, stating that the people of New York will repay Spider-Man's kindness in the way that men like Norman always believe that kindness is eventually repaid with hatred and emptiness. And he implores Spider-Man to hear the truth, that being that the eight million people of the city are there to serve only one purpose, to lift the few exceptional people among them onto their shoulders, to bleed and suffer for their betters so they might have their lives fulfilled through their glory. Interestingly enough, the Goblin doesn't offer Spider-Man the chance at becoming his co-conspirator in mass murder, asking him instead to imagine what they could create together, which could indicate a happy future of cooperation that would see the both of them ascending to new lofty positions, however unlikely that is. But whatever microscopic sliver of good intentions there are to be found here are outshone by his presentation of apparently the only other option for the two, endless selfish battle that will result in destruction and the death of innocence. The Goblin is obviously trying his best to manipulate Spider-Man man here. But it's interesting to note that again, the extremes of Norman's personality, in this case narcissism and egoism, are very much prevalent here, as the Goblin is appearing to give Spider-Man one good choice and one bad, those choices being join me or die. And though the Goblin might be fooling himself here, that he's simply stating an immovable truth, he's adopting a my way or the highway attitude and refusing to consider the many other options present in this scenario, which harkens back to how Norman managed to keep his company in his control with the same attitude and using some similar methods, though I bet Norman never set a building on fire and posed as an old woman to bait his competition into a perilous position in an attempt to force their hand. Now that Norman has become aware of his other half, the goblin portion of him is slowly starting to take control, and our first indicator of this is when he attends Thanksgiving at Harry and Peter's apartment. The first sign we're given is when he makes a private joke by stating that work was murder when he's explaining why he was late. But though Norman may have always been a bit of a womanizer, when he meets Mary Jane, we're treated with a disgusting display of perversion. Initially, he seems to be impressed with her in the same way he was impressed with Peter when he met him for the first time, eyeing her with appreciation and giving his son the nod of approval. However, when he looks at her while his son is turned away, he eyes her with a lustful look that's beyond creepy showing us that the goblin slime is bubbling to the surface, and we're given even more when Aunt May slaps his hand away from one of the sides, a murderous look coming across his face as he sharpens the carving knife with bloodlust in his eyes. But the most overt display of goblinness from Norman is his speech to Harry regarding MJ after he leaves, that a beautiful woman like MJ is only hanging around Harry for one thing, money, and that Harry should do what he needs to with her and get rid of her fast. An uncouth display of misogyny from Norman that would have likely never happened pre-Goblin, but was something that was still probably inherent to his character nonetheless. As if you'll recall from the newspaper article we covered earlier, Norman's marriage to his wife was an unhappy one, and with this mindset, it's no mystery why it was so. And this is yet another example of the Goblin taking the components of Norman's personality to the extreme. Now during the attempted dinner, Norman discovered that Peter was in fact Spider-Man, and upon returning home to digest this new information, Norman is yet again made to struggle with the other side of his personality. Initially offering up a small amount of pitiful resistance to the idea of killing Peter, Norman eventually capitulates to the Goblin and warms up to the idea of making him suffer through pain and loss before killing him, choosing to target Aunt May with a show of sadism in order to weaken Peter while also letting him know that he knows who he is. But his greatest opportunity to bait Peter into an unfavorable situation comes when Harry reveals his love for MJ after they've broken up, an opportunity that Norman would soon seize upon. However, not before showing the gentler side of himself for the penultimate time, admitting that he hasn't always been there for his son and promising that soon enough, after he's rectified certain iniquities, he'll be making it up to him. In the ensuing battle with Spider-Man following his kidnapping of MJ, the Goblin wreaks havoc along the Queensboro Bridge, bombing buildings along its base and cutting the cable off the Roosevelt Island tram car that's full of children and taking them hostage. The lunatic presenting Spider-Man with a sadistic choice, save the children or save the woman he loves. Spider-Man manages to save both, but not without suffering grave injury himself. And after another grueling confrontation with the Goblin, where he once again admonishes Spider-Man for choosing to rebuff his offer of friendship and threatens to torture MJ due to his insolence, the Goblin is brought to his knees. And though the gentler side of Norman is still lying beneath the surface of the Goblin's overwhelming persona, he's so far gone at this point that even when he's regressed to his former self and is attempting to broker peace with Peter, the Goblin is still in control. 
but through hubris, the goblin is finally undone, impaled upon his own glider as Norman manages to shine through in his last moments, imploring Peter not to reveal to his son the awful truth of what he's done. That may have been the end for Norman Osborn in that timeline, but he was granted a second chance at wreaking havoc in another when he was pulled into the universe of the MCU. And here, we find a Norman who's very much struggling with the turmoil roiling within him, initially arriving in the universe mid-goblin, only to once again become dejected once he's removed the mask, fighting with his alter ego once again as it attempts to coax him into conquering the new world they've just arrived in. Norman is distraught and confused, appearing as a man in need of help who's struggling with the beast inside of him and the new world he's found himself in. But everything Norman says here has to be taken with a grain of salt, as he, like the other villains, arrived just as they were about to be eliminated by Spider-Man. And if that's the case, the Norman we see here is very much ingrained with his other half. And even though he might still lose his memory when the goblin takes over and appears to admonish him when he smashes his mask, we have to consider that from the very moment he entered this universe, Norman, no matter how feeble and helpless he might seem, is likely very much the same man who was willing to listen to the goblin towards the end of the previous film. And this is all but confirmed by the fact that underneath his street clothes lies his armor, a nod to the fact that the goblin was either in control from the very beginning or Norman was in league with his other half from the start. If that's the case, he does quite the good job of hiding it, as his assistance of Peter during his attempts to fix the villains appears to be genuine and kind-hearted. But that's quickly thrown out the window once Doc Ock has a conversation with Norman, where he's speaking of the virtues of returning to their former selves, unburdened by the darkness of their sins. Here the Goblin has a conversation with those present, much akin to the one he had with Peter in his own universe, bashing the moral superiority of May and Peter while espousing that he and the men in his presence with similar gifts are nothing short of gods who need not abandon their power. The master manipulation of the Green Goblin, out in full force, to marshal his cohorts to take what is theirs rather than choose to live as mortals. Sadism, masochism, and his overt disgust at morality on full display as he battles with Peter, the goblin brings him to the very brink of death and impales May in much the same way as he was impaled in his own universe, flying off to begin the process of dominating this new world. At the climactic final battle, the goblin plays sadistic mind games with Peter, goading him into fighting him by telling him that May's death was ultimately his fault. But after stabbing his Peter and being cured by the combined efforts of the three, Norman regains control of himself and is presumably taken away to his own universe to live a life unburdened by his dark ambitions. And at this end, who was Norman Osborn, the Green Goblin? He was a man of genius intellect who built an empire through his own determination, a man who knew what he wanted, developing a monumental ego as a result of his intelligence and success. Norman became mired in the fallacies of unchecked greed and ambition, reaching the point in his life where the things that mattered to him most were success and more success. Willing to risk his own life in order to ensure that continued to be the case, Norman was granted superhuman abilities and a superhuman other half, a monstrous entity playing off the extremes present in his personality that slowly took control of his life until there wasn't much Norman left. As the manipulative, sadistic, and utterly merciless Green Goblin, Norman's cavalier business practices turned from stubbornness and egocentricity to murder and terror, torching the lives of those in his way so he might ascend to the heights of godhood that he'd always dreamed of attaining. Norman was ultimately a flawed man, one who held darkness in his personality, but who he was, prior to his inhalation of his performance enhancers, was tame in comparison. And once the goblin took over, he sowed death and destruction at will that would have likely never ended had he not been brought to heal, the result of an exponentially intelligent man flirting with the limits of human potential and breaking the confines of his fragile morality to immerse himself in evil. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on the Green Goblin? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you liked this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, and to my patrons, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server and Reddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.